The interviewers today are Audrey Borba and Jack Holes, students of Da Vinci Charter Academy. The veteran being interviewed today is Dylan Hunt. The date is November 16, 2016, and we are interviewing in Davis, California. Uh, to start, can you please tell us where you were born and when you were born? I was born in Reno, Nevada on, a, on November 3rd of 1987. Uh, who are, are or were your parents and what are or were their occupations? Uh, my mother is uh, Pamela, uh, Pamela Hunt. She was a, how to explain, she worked for uh, the Sacramento Media School Utility District as sort of an accountant but for electricity, I suppose I'd say. The dad, uh, Randall Stewart Hunt, he worked as a contract engineer for, engineer for the state for uh, power systems and whatnot. Uh, do you have any siblings? I do. I have one brother. His name's Alex. He lives in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's also an engineer. And I have a sister <coughs> named Leanna, and I do not know where she is. She cut up all contact with my family quite a few years ago. Uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? I was in high school. Um, I was in high school until June of 06, and I tried college while I was trying to get the paperwork done for the Army, and uh, I'm glad I did not stay with college at the time. Uh, I entered service in November, so ha ha halfway through the fall semester, and I, I, I quit college then. In which branch of the military did you serve? I, was, I, I served in the U.S. Army in the, in the uh, infantry. Um, did the Secretary of State Colin Powell's speech to the U.N. or the President Bush speech, Operation Iraqi Freedom, influence your joining at all? No, my influence of joining uh, all throughout my childhood, you know, I played soldiers with my friends. I, had little toy soldiers. I, uh, my, my first actual memory was of the 221st Cav Regiment, or one of those, Nevada National Guard coming home from the first, uh, first Gulf War back in 91. And I remember them marching through Reno, and uh, that was my first memory. So it's, it's, it's always been kind of ingrained. My entire family is military. Uh, yeah. Um, what happened when you departed for a training camp, or uh, do you have any short stories you'd like to share about your early days of training? <laughs> uh, so, I finally signed my contract on October, early October 2nd, thereabouts, and that day I got into a massive fight with my parents about it, and they kicked me out. So, uh, from that point, for that, for that month, the four weeks between me signing and me shipping out to basic training, I lived with a friend of mine. When I finally shipped out, it was actually on, on my birthday on November 3rd. And uh, start, I started basic training that night in Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, I remember the second day of basic training realizing that I don't want to be here. When I was being yelled at by a almost seven foot guy who weighed about 280 pounds, all muscle, and just looked like he could snap me in half. I had run on about a half hour of sleep, being screamed at all the time, and I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, I actually, looking back on it, I liked basic training, to be perfectly honest with you. I had no bills. I had no real worries. Everything was taken care of. I had a bed to sleep in, most times. I had three meals a day. I, every day was something new, something new to learn, something new to do. Looking back on it, it wasn't so bad. But, yeah. um, so you talked about your first basic training instructor, but were there any other instructors that you remember, like specific memories about or anything? There was. Uh, hit the basic training instructor that I really, the only one that I remember, I remember the name of was uh, Senior, Senior Drill Sergeant Nettles. That was a guy that was almost seven feet, and I'm not even kidding about that. He was six foot eleven and a half, and he made sure that the half got in there. Um, but uh, he was very tough. He never had to raise his voice in order to intimidate you. He did that 
by sheer presence. But I remember him specifically because he was never cruel. A lot of the drill sergeants are there just for power's sake or because they had to be there and they, and they didn't like doing it. This guy liked training people, liked making sure that we love basic training with actual knowledge. Because a lot of the times basic training, you leave with the ability to follow instructions, but you don't leave with any practical knowledge of what combat is actually like in the modern world. We used weapons that hadn't been used in 20 years. We used uh, camouflage schemes the army doesn't use anymore, gear that the army doesn't use anymore. Because that's not the point. Your unit will train you in current, uh, in current equipment. But the point of basic training is, is to teach you how to be a soldier, how to, how, how to follow directions and really react the way you should. But he made sure that we knew a lot more than just that. And I remember about two years after basic training, we were uh, down in the Mojave Desert training for a deployment to Iraq. And I saw him again. It was kind of one of those double take, like, oh my God, he's back. And he walked in and says, so you survived? Yes, I did. And he was very surprised, which is, which is interesting. And um, one of the most disliked drill sergeants of my entire, uh, entire uh, class, I guess, you, I guess you say, was, I don't remember his name, but he was a Michigan National... Michigan National Guardsman who was, act, who was activated to become uh, to come a dr become drill sergeant for a year, and he made sure that we knew he did not want to be there. He wasn't that good. Just actually kind of depressing. So we had two good ones, and one really bad one for our platoon. Um, you did mention that you were cross trained as a medic. What was that training like? So, part of the problem with Iraq, or, well, with the army in general, is that there is one medic for about every 50 guys. And when you're doing patrols in Iraq, uh, when an IED hits, the standard procedure is to lock up all the vehicles until we can be sure that there's no secondary IEDs or an ambush is not is not going to happen right afterwards. That's pr that's very common. So. Let me, let, me, let me explain. An IED is an improvised explosive device. Basically, it's a bomb by the side of the road. It can be made with literally anything. Um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the times, they would set off an IED underneath the vehicle and then have other ones further on or further up the road where, where the vehicles would stop to help the vehicle that got hit. So people would dismount from the vehicles and they would get hurt even worse because they're outside the vehicles at the time. So what our battalion did was they had one guy from each squad, so one guy from each vehicle, be trained, cross-trained as a medic, as much as the medics that are currently assigned to the, assigned to the company can train us. So it wasn't really a medic per se, but I, but I was trained more than just the average infantryman. Um, how would you? How did you adapt to military life, including the change in physical regimen, barracks food, and social life? Well, first off, barracks food. Not as bad as they say, especially <laughs> breakfast. The army is the best breakfast I've ever had in my entire life. Could be just the fact that I was completely hungry the entire time, but every, all the other meals really were not that good. But breakfast food is great. As far as adaption, it took me couple of weeks to really get in the swing of things and realize that all you had to do was really just show up at the right time, the right uniform, the right place. And if you do that, well, you're good. Adaption really just is that much. It's realizing, you just do what you're told. Done. It wasn't that hard with that. And now we're going to transition to the Jack set of questions. All right. Um, so, where did you serve? Uh, so, basic training. Uh, basic training uh, t took place from to November second to March second ish in Fort Benning, Georgia, at the second of the fifty eighth Infantry Training Regiment. 
From there, I was stationed in uh, Fort Wayne, Wright, Fort Wayne, Wright, Alaska, uh, which is pretty much dead center of Alaska. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, in October of '07, I spent a month in India, and then from September of '08 to September of '09, I was spent in Iraq. Oh, okay. When you were in Alaska, was it snowing most of the time? Yes, but the but the but actually, it's a good question because that far north is almost too it's often too cold to snow, which I didn't think really? was a thing, but it is. What happens is that the moisture in the air actually freezes midair. It's called ice fog. You can actually write your name with your hand in the air, and it'll it'll stay there for a couple couple of seconds because it's just frozen. It, it is the worst thing to work out in, I'll tell you that much right now. <laughs> um, if you served abroad, um, what are some memories that you have of that experience? So, oh man, where to start with that? The, the flight over there, so we, um, it's a 15 hour flight, grand total. Okay. Uh, flying from Fairbanks Airport First to Shannon, Ireland, and then from Shannon, Ireland, to Kuwait. Because they they sent us to Kuwait first to acclim acclimatize to the environment, which doesn't make any sense because Kuwait is completely different from Iraq. It's like a, huh. it's like a constant low low setting hair dryer blown in your face full of sand. It's 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 a hellish place. Um, but the flight over there, I remember taking like a sleeping medication of some variety mm -hmm. that was handed out by the uh, Italian doctor. I remember waking up in Kuwait. Apparently I got the plane in Ireland. I don't uh. remember it at all. Um, which is kind of sad, I like Ireland. Uh, after Kuwait, we, um, we crossed the border in, into Iraq and we got stationed at a place called FOB Normandy. Mm -hmm. is, uh, FOB is Forward Operating Base. Basically, a base with about a thousand guys that we shared with the Iraqi army. We, um, there, uh, my platoon was uh, designated a sector of, uh, of a city of Muqtadiyah okay. to patrol. How many men were in your platoon? Uh, 21. 21. Normally, it's about 60, but ours was very shorthanded. Okay. Normally the fourth platoon of any company, which I was a part, is a mortar and support. Okay. So, uh, mortars, um, heavy machine guns, uh, rocket launchers, that sort of thing. But okay. they needed a fourth, what they call maneuver platoon, which is the first three platoons. And they, and they needed a fourth one, so they just put a bunch more guys in our platoon and said, here, have a sector, enjoy. <laughs> which made us targets because we didn't have as many people. Or uh, many people. So would you guys be going, since you said you're the fourth platoon, so the first three other platoons would be going in before you? Well, the thing is, uh, in like stand-up combat, that'd be, you'd be right about that. Okay. But uh, over there, it's less of just uh, taking ground and taking, you know, taking the hill or whatever. It's more doing daily patrols. Uh, there were, I think, four or five different, different missions that we did. Okay. Uh, there'd be what's called a KLE, or Key Leader Engagement. We'd go out and talk to the Sheik or the Mukhtar, uh, local, local religious leaders or the local mayor of, okay. the, city where we're, of the city or the sector of the city where, we're, where we were at. Mm -hmm. go, and go talk to them, ask them, what do you need? What do you, what do you and your people require to have a better way of life? Oh, so you're just asking the things that like, they were missing out on? Right, okay. And, just, okay. and just trying to get intelligence from them and just trying to make their life better. No, is that like a way of like kind of getting on their side or like getting them to, to like you guys? Okay. Right. Um, then there was a mission called Log Packs, which is a logistical something. Basically, it's a convoy of uh, trucks carrying need, needed supplies for our base. Okay. We go to the main supply base and come back with this convoy. Very boring. Very slow work. Okay. Then there uh, was called a cordon and knock which is basically you, you take a bunch of vehicles, surround a sector of the city, and just go through it with a fine tooth comb, looking for uh, people we call HVTs or high value targets, 
People like hiding inside of... Right. Okay. People hiding in basements and in the houses themselves, and in plain sight. Uh, bomb making factories, that sort of thing. Okay. Those sorts so of things. So would you guys, you said you'd park all your cars, like, so you'd like circle it around the village or you kind of just, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. or the perimeter where yeah. you're on going the, on to? Perimeter, and then we'd send uh, like, like two platoons surrounding the actual uh, sector of the village oh, okay. or whatever. And then another, another two platoons going in, going house to house, just most of the time it's, you know, you knock on the door, they answer, and then you search the place. It's very rarely where we actually like, you know, blowing down doors or actually shooting. What did it like? Very, very, very rare. Feel like doing that though, like being one of the people not around the perimeter but inside, just searching through, like oh, not knowing what to expect. That's the worst part. It's the not knowing part. It's the waiting. It's like you. Ex one of the things that they condition you is for is to is to expect contact. Is to is is to expect to be shot at. And half the time you're just waiting for it to happen, oh. and that's the worst part. Okay. Combat's actually easy. Yeah. It's it's, just... it's it's easy to do. It's easy just to just just to shoot back. It's instinctive. But this is like the leading up it's point. It's the waiting to... part. It's the night not ninety percent, ninety five percent even over there is just waiting, waiting, okay. waiting and waiting and boredom and <laughs> yeah, that's okay. like most things. All right. So um, if you were on the front lines. What combat actions did you witness? If you're not on the front lines, um, what were your duties? So I was, I guess, on the front lines. Really, there really isn't any front lines yeah. in Iraq. There's really just kind of warfare all around. Okay. Um, one of the things that sticks with me is uh, April 19th, 2009. Or April 23rd, actually. It was 2009. Uh, suicide bomber blew up in a restaurant, a crowded restaurant, in the town of um, in the town of Imam Wais. Mm -hmm. Killed 75 people or so, and we responded to it. We were it was right outside the gate of our base, and we mm. and we were just leaving as it happened, and we got there just to watch a bunch of people die because we couldn't help them. We weren't allowed to help them. You weren't allowed to help the people that were blown because up basically? Because it was a civil war thing. They didn't say it was a civil war, but it was a civil war. It okay. Was. So the 70 people plus that died, those were just civilians inside civilians. of this town? Sunni versus Shia. And it, uh, you know, all the things that happened to me of, you know, getting blown up, getting shot, and all the all, the, all, the, all these things. I don't care about that. I was prepared for that. Yeah. We went over there to... I went over there specifically to try and change something. To try and do some good for somebody else. And then I ended up having to sit there and watch. A lot of the, all, all of the time, it shit happened to people. It's things happened to people. Sorry, I swear a lot, so just tell me if I'm doing it. <laughs> You're good. Um, yeah, it's just... it's. The rougher things to remember because we were always conditioned to do something about it. Don't complain, just do something. So basically, you could only really react when things were, when basically when you guys were attacked or when they would exactly. do things to you guys. Exactly, because otherwise it's it's uh, it's a civil matter. We could we could give them medical supplies, but we couldn't actually apply them ourselves. We weren't allowed. It's a political thing. Huh. Okay. It was one is one of the few regrets I actually have about my time in the time of service is because I didn't help that. Yeah, no, no that makes sense. Um, so why is that Iraq war different than other wars? Um, so like basically like you kind of answered why there aren't front lines, mm -hmm. but basically just why is, why do you think that is different than other wars? Obviously, I wasn't in Vietnam. But from what I know, it wasn't that much different from it. You know, it's not jungle, it's sand, for the most part. Mm -hmm. But from what I know, from the people I've talked to, from the books I've read, the shows I've watched, all those things, it's a lot like it. There's no front lines. There, you're, 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 you're fighting an idea in Iraq. You can't win against that. Okay. Now, World War II, it, you're fighting against a country. You yeah. can win against that. You can defeat a country's army. Yeah. In Iraq, there was no 
there was no machine to defeat. Yeah, you're just... There was no... There's nothing tangible to destroy. Okay. There was just... An idea. Just an idea. And you can't kill an idea. Um... Um, so... Um, so what idea were... So what idea were you fighting? Or were you guys supposed to be? That is a good question. The idea that they didn't... Man, that actually... Not that good, I guess. Like... Yeah, that's a good one. Is it... Was it mostly just like when they taught you when you saw a specific look or specific group of people? It's like... Um, we, 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 we were taught to uh, be aware of what we called military age males. Okay. Those who, like, the most radicalized, uh, I guess, population of the people in Iraq that, that, that were there was people within the age of 20 to 40. Males. Okay. The age, of, age of 20 to 40. That's 90 something percent of the people that attacked us. Okay. The thing is, most of the time, Al Qaeda would pay five bucks to a farmer to go shoot at us or, or plant a bomb in the road. Oftentimes, that farmer, five bucks is more, is more money than he'd see in 10 years. Yeah. So, what's a farmer going to do? It's like if, if, he, if he says no, Al Qaeda's going to kill his family. If he says yes, he, he gets five bucks, but. But then you guys would turn on him. It's oftentimes that happens, and oftentimes we end up killing them. It's it's you can't win that kind of war. It's just same yeah. thing that happened to Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, okay. You're fighting against an idea like we were there to try and make a country. Uh huh. They don't care about their country. They care about their tribe, about their family, about the people right next to them, about 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 their side of the religion, of the religious fight that they're in. They don't care about Iraq as a country. They care about the, the welfare of their tribe. Okay. Our our sense of country, our flag, everything like that matters to us because that's what ties us together as individuals. To them, it's their family name. It's their father, it's the patriarch, it's the matriarch, it's Shia, Sunni, Kurd. Mm -hmm. Not Iraq. Right. Yeah. Um, so the next question I have for you, um, so, it seems like you witnessed combat. Um, how did you feel when witnessing casualties or destruction going on? When it happened, not much. But afterwards, not great. Honestly, it's it's like dur during during the actual combat, you you kind of put everything away in a box and you just kind of do your job at the time. At least the good soldiers do. Mm -hmm. The useful soldiers do that. But after you open that box at whatever time it is afterwards, could be that night, could be a decade later. Mm -hmm. after, you, after you open that box and look at what actually happened, it ain't good. I've seen my friends blown up. I've seen my friends shot. Bad friends die right in front of me. I've seen a lot of people die. It's not great. Mm -hmm. But at the time, you bottle it up. You can't deal with it right then. Otherwise, you, you can't do your job. Do you kind of have that feeling towards Iraqis or people on the other side that you saw die? You, you mean like hatred towards them or something like that? Or no, did you just feel the same way? If, if it seems like if you looked back on those things, maybe not actions that you did, but mm -hmm. actions that you saw, mm -hmm. did you like feel the same resemblance as you did towards your friends that had died next to you? Not the same. It's di like for them, it for for the people I served with is like a, a person in your family dying. But I'll, but I'll tell you something. Um, during that uh, suicide bomber thing I told you about. I saw a guy, uh, roughly my age, and both of his legs blown off below the knee, uh, shrapnel and burns of the upper body, he was, and he was bleeding to death, and he was looking at me. And I, 
you don't forget things like that yeah. ever I don't feel hatred towards them. I don't feel like they deserved it or anything like that. I just feel like everyone's stuck in a position you don't want to be in. Yeah. We're interfering in a civil war. We created a civil war over there. That's the problem. Yeah. And it's a situation that no one wants to be in. Um, so basically leading off of like your friends and stuff that you're just talking about, like, what kind of friendships in, um, did you form while you were serving in, was there anyone in particular or a group of guys in particular that you remember? Mm -hmm. So, I wasn't close friends the, with a lot of people I worked with. I th think of it more like it was like a family. Mm -hmm. You don't get along with all your family. Yeah. You you fight with your brothers, you you know, you you know, you fight with your dad, whatever. And you don't often like most of your family, but you just deal with them because you have to. You don't yeah. have a choice. So there was a couple of guys though. Uh one, uh Douglas J. Green. He was one of the best soldiers I ever met. Really good guy. Mm-hmm. He died uh, six years ago in Afghanistan. He was hit with a rocket and there was nothing left of him. And where's dog tags? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, back in 09, another friend of mine from basic training uh, died in Afghanistan as well, n near the same place actually. Hmm. And uh, nothing left of him either. Deep buried bomb, blew apart his vehicle, vaporized everything. A lot of it happened that way. But it's really just like a family. You don't you, you don't always get along, but are you, you love them. Then, are the you same. still in touch with any of them? No, no. no I, I did for a couple of years afterward, but it's one of the things that really kind of I don't know saddened me about the army. Is that the whole band of brothers thing? Like you know, like mm -hmm. the book and the show and. Everyone's stuck together after after the war and all this stuff doesn't happen. Yeah, it's very rare when a unit comes together like that. Everyone kind of just goes back to their yeah old lives. Some stay in the army, some move on to another unit, and most of the guys uh, got out and just went went back to their old lives. So, do you think you made some of your closer friendships during the basic training or when you were there on duty? On on, on duty, on duty. That, but most of my friends ended up dying. Um, um, what did you do for recreation or uh, when you were off duty Rec or recreation? You mean like uh, in Iraq or mm. just in general? No, just, just in general. Well, it can be in Iraq and when off duty. Mm -hmm. So in Alaska, uh, we like to go play hockey. It's one of the cooler things about living in Alaska is that uh, you can just scrape off a parking lot from all, all, all the snow and it looks kind of nice. Uh, play hockey. I just play. Just, uh. just play. It's fun. Um, to be honest, we drank a lot. Like it, As long as you kept it in the barracks yeah. and didn't let it go out in the real world, mm -hmm. uh, everyone, everyone was, was pretty much okay with it. No one really agrees with the you got to be twenty one to drink, but 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 you can be you, you know you can be shot at eighteen for your country. It's great, yeah. Um, so no one really agreed with that, and everyone just kind of just you know, cold, you know, blind eye to it. Yeah. As long as we didn't, you know, as long as we weren't stupid. Mm hmm. I have actually a question. Is uh, chewing tobacco still big? Oh God, yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do it. I didn't smoke. I didn't get chewing tobacco, but. At least half of my company uh, uh, dipped. Dip. Yeah, dip of the call. Yeah, and oh God, it's disgusting. <laughs> Mostly, they did that because it's it's easy. It's easier to do it because if you're in like combat or uh, say like we're training for like an ambush or something like that, you got to be you know still and silent. You can dip a lot easier than you smoke because, you know, the enemy can smell smoke, see smoke, yada, yada, yada. So yeah. A lot, a lot of guys still smoke in the army. Mm -hmm. Get used to carrying all that weight and be able to move? No. I mean, I mean, you you might get, like, used to carrying it for a while, but you're, 
my my spine is completely screwed. My low back actually calcified in some of the muscle. That that happens when you have stressed your back out, you know, worked out so much, tore some muscles in your back, and you can't let it heal. Your body goes, okay, I can't heal that. I'm gonna throw some calcium in there. <laughs> Try and bridge the gap. Mm. So your body, your, your muscles calcify, and that that sure does some does some not so good stuff for uh, yeah, uh, you know, flexibility mm. or strength. Um. Talking about some of your weapons, so what kind of weapons were you trained on, and mm -hmm. then what type of weapons later on were you given to use? So I was trained on everything in the U.S. Army inventory that that uh, is carried by 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 an infantryman. Everything from the M14 rifle, the M16 rifle, the M4 rifle. We had the uh, 1911 pistol, which I don't know why we trained on that. That hasn't been something in the U.S. Army inventory for 20 years. Uh, the M9 pistol. Uh, we trained on the M249 light machine gun, M240 Bravo medium machine gun, the M2 heavy machine gun, the Mark 19 grenade launcher, the off of like all the GM 189 Javelin he heavy anti tank missile launcher, which we never used, um, AT4 light rocket launcher, which we used a lot. Uh, Grenades, all different types. Yeah. Uh, Basically, with all those different sizes and weights, does that like affect someone's ability to be to use them like as effectively as maybe like I don't know with maybe <clears throat> maybe a rifle that you were pretty well trained at, and then you're going on to rocket launcher. Right. So. Um, Do they like train you guys differently on how to use every different weapon? So. Every, every person is given like a general knowledge how to work each weapon, right? Mm -hmm. But each person ha has a specialty. So like one guy in the squad is going to know how to work the Javelin missile launcher. But most guys are going are to know how to work the AT-4 because it's more common. Mm -hmm. The Javelin has, is like a $2 million like infrared radar scanning thing attached to an $85,000 heavy missile that can go like four miles and, and, and hit like this, right? Yeah, the AT4 is an unguided light rocket that can barely scratch a tank, so it's much more common, much more simple to use. Uh, okay. Most everyone, like everyone, is able to use an M4 rifle. Most everyone can work. Most everyone is required to be able to work in the machine guns and whatnot. But there's only like a specialized few that can work, like the sniper rifles. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah. I'm not that great a shot. I. I shot a machine gun. A lot of bullets in the right direction, you know. Yeah. So uh, was yeah. So what was your specialty then? Or like, what one did you? What weapon did you M prefer? M two forty Bravo, the four foot long, thirty pound weapon. It, it, that thing is crazy. It's the, it's, the, it's one of the best built weapons I've I've ever encountered. It doesn't jam. Yeah. Um. Uh. If if so, um, what do you remember about? The salt on Fallujah? The salt on Fallujah. That was before my time. Oh, that was before that your time? That was uh, 2004. Okay. Um, well, where were you on the time when uh, Saddam Hussein was executed? I was actually uh, in Baghdad when he was executed. You were in Baghdad? But okay. I was nowhere near it, and I, and I, and I actually uh, uh, didn't know it until months afterwards. So... I was nowhere near it. Um, so were there any major missions that or battles that you were assigned to? And um, what different cities were you in, stationed in? So there was a clearing operation uh, in the city which, in which we were assigned to for the first nine months. That was uh, the city of Muktadia. Um, basically, we, it's a, we got to this city... And uh, we said, okay, well, we're just going to clear house. And so the entire battalion just went door to door for about two weeks time, just searching everybody, getting everybody on like lists. So, okay, you live here, you live here, you live here. You have X amount of family members. Okay, you belong to this district and 
yada yada yada. But that was pretty simple. I mean, it yeah. wasn't it wasn't that crazy. It just took a long time. Yeah, just getting everyone's basic information down. Right. So later on, about June of '09, we got restationed to a place called Abu Saida. That place sucked. That place was just hell. We got ambushed all the time, blown up all the time, and we couldn't even move without getting shot at. And, uh, yeah, that place was not great. So when you were sent there, were you sent there to do the same type of mission by just going door to door? And we t we, we, We'd talk with the Iraqi army, we'd talk with the, the local mayors and religious leaders, and just, uh, we do what's called presence patrols, where you just drive around and uh, talk to people and just say, okay, we're here, you know, we're not, it's like we're not going away anytime soon, we're here to stay. Yeah. Supposedly. But, yeah, M much the same thing, just a different place. Different place. So it, when you guys first got to that area, did it kind of seem well known that that they just did not want you there? Is yeah. that why you're kind of making it seem like it was such a bad place? Yeah, because the the platoon that we were that we were replacing, we 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 were taking over their, their territory and they ours uh, because they had lost six guys in the area, mm -hmm. and they said, okay, they need to be transferred out before they get. You know, two undermanned, or a lot of the times units that take take a lot of casualties. Uh, they get uh, they can sometimes get crazy, and, and they can just get grief and anger and not being able to do anything about it. Because it, it is an IED. It blows mm -hmm. up your friend. What can you do? Yeah. You don't know who put you. You don't know who placed it. You don't. You don't know. The, you don't. You don't. You don't know who the sniper is that shot your friend. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. The anger has to go somewhere. And often, and oftentimes, it's, it's happened a lot in Iraq, where the anger gets expressed to the wrong people. Like, uh, let's see, what's the book? Uh, Black Hearts. It's about the um, what was it? mask I stand by. Oh, was it uh, back in '05 or so? A group of uh, 101st Division uh, troops uh, massacred a family. Hmm. Just lost it. Just took their anger out on. That happens, and lot, and after that, a lot of battalion commanders, brigade commanders, begin begin shuffling their people around. Those who were in higher hit areas get shuffled to a lower hit area, mm -hmm. and just you know, given a rest for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it, it, it's a good thing. You know, you can only take so much. Yeah, until you just get out of there. Until you snap. Mm hmm. Um. What kind of buildings did you sleep in, or what did you sleep in? So, um, when we first got posted to Fob Normandy, we were told, okay, that's your building. It's a bombed out bunker that, w that was hit by a guided bomb at the beginning of the Iraqi war. And it was just full of rubble, and there's a, no ceiling, and we're like, what the hell is this? We spent three weeks living in living in our vehicles while we built up this place and made okay. it livable, cleaned it up and whatnot. But after that, we lived actually decently well for combat. I mean, we weren't sleeping in foxholes, that's for sure. I mean, I had a uh, I had a mattress. You know, granted, it was flea infested, but whatever. It was a mattress, mm -hmm. and now uh, yeah, we we even had internet. Got a satellite from Kuwait and uh, had internet over there. That was nice. Huh. Um, so, how did you feel when um, Obama decided, when he announced that he'd be doing the exit plan? Um, at the time, I didn't believe him, and I still believe him because it hasn't happened yet. We still have troops over there fighting, so yeah, I still don't believe him. Okay. Um, I don't mind the guy, but just that never happened yeah. for whatever reason. Um. So after the war, when you were, come, so where were you when the war ended? It hasn't. Yeah. Supposedly, Iraqi uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom ended back in what was it, eleven or twelve? Yeah. But uh, we still have troops over there. Mm -hmm. There's still troops fighting in Iraq. Do you it think? It hasn't ended. Do you think it's as heavy as it was when it's you not, were there? It's not as heavy as it was when I, uh, as it was when I, when I was there. 
But when it ended, when we finally started giving stuff over and, I, and ISIS pretty much took, took control, it's like the place where I was at is now ISIS territory. It's not. Hell, um, back in 08, we were fighting ISIS. They were actually a big, a big, uh, a big uh, terrorist group in the area. And they were just as crazy back then. They were the guys like killing civilians left and right and just insane. They grew a lot since we left them. Mm. But um, they, uh, the province where I was in, so Iraq is made, made of provinces, right? Like states here. Yeah. Uh, we were in Diyala province. And ISIS started out in Bakuba, which is the capital of, uh, of Diyala. And they, uh, they were there back in 08. Now were they just, so they just weren't as big? They were, they, they were very small back then, yeah. They were a, kind of like an offshoot of uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Were they well known though for, no, no? No, they were really, really small. They were well known for being savages though. Savages, okay. And they were, they would chop people's heads off. They were just, just bad. Um, do you think the soldiers will ever be taken out anytime soon? I hope so. Honestly, it's just not worth it. You can't you can't build somebody a country. You got to be able to fight for it. And the Iraqis, like I said before, they care more about their family than than they do about a state. They don't want a state. Well, that's what you get. Yeah, you get what you fight for. And we can't pay the blood price for a country, for mm -hmm. another country. We can't do it. You can't build democracy. Democracy comes from the ground up, not from other people telling you you should do this. It doesn't work that way. So I think you just cut your losses and run. Yeah. Um, so how did you return home? By plane. Was that a, how long did that take? Uh, I mean from Iraq and, to, and back to Alaska? Probably the same, probably 15, 15, 18 hours. Okay. Long plane flight. Um, so when you came home, how were you received by your family and your com community? Well, pretty low key. I mean, I'm a low key person. Just, just in general, I don't like parties. I don't like big celebrations and whatnot. But my parents met me at the met, met me at the airport when I flew back home uh, in uh, October of '09, uh, and I got some in and out. That's good. <laughs> got some in and out. Oh, yeah. First thing, boy home. Double double. Oh yeah. Um, so what do you, so what do you think about the actions currently being taken against ISIS? I don't know. Honestly, I don't think it's doing any good. But I, honest, I don't honestly see another option. Letting those guys just run rampant throughout the Middle East is not good. Yeah. I mean, it destabilizes an already destabilized place. My, but my, my problem is not enough of the Middle Eastern countries of which it affects are doing anything about it. Yeah. They're relying on us to do something. It's like, we shouldn't be there at all. They should be handling their own business, but they aren't. Mm -hmm. um, so when you came back and you were done with your military life, um, how did you readjust to the normal civilian life? It took a long time. I still think I'm doing it from day to day. I mean, I still wake up really early. I still work out every morning really early. I still make my own bed all the time. Precisely. <laughs> Weird. But, um, there, I mean, like, obviously I let my hair grow out and I don't wear a uniform anymore, so there's that, but, uh, when I keep a lot of the good things that that I like and that benefit me from the military. Yeah. Like routine, like cleanliness, that sort of thing. But I lost a lot of the things I didn't like. Like just the everyday nonsense that they put us through. Doing a job for a job's sake, I, I don't believe in that kind of thing. Like. You need to clean because cleaning is good for you. Just just go clean that corner for like three three hours. They did that a lot. <laughs> really, the infantry is just a janitor, a bad janitor at that. Um. 
So, um, what have you done since separating from the military? Uh, so, when I got out, I spent about a year uh, working as a uh, weapons instructor, just for random people, just like uh, people who just didn't know how to shoot a gun at all and just wanted to know the basics. I called it How to Not Shoot Yourself in the Head 101. Like this is a this is a pistol. This is how it works. This is how a safety works. This is what safety looks like. This is what maintaining a weapon is like. This is what you should not do with a weapon. Shooting came later, but I just this is how you keep a weapon safe in the household with children. Mm -hmm. This is how you keep a, a weapon safe from anybody, really. Because yeah. remember a I remember a stat a uh, stat uh, while a while back. I said that. 80% of all in-home uh, deaths resulted from their own weapon. That's interesting. So basically, I just take people and say, okay, this is how this is how everything works. Make them buy like a gun safe or at the very least a barrel lock Yeah. for the weapons. And I like that kind of job. I like, I'll, yeah. I like to teach people the very basics. Everyone should know at least how to save a weapon. How to, yeah. how to make sure it's not going to harm anybody at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is or are some of the best lessons that you've learned from your service? The best lesson that I, that I learned is just to do something. A lot of the times, like especially, especially on, on like a test, you find a problem where you're, just, you're stumped, right? Everyone, yeah. every, everyone's been here. Yeah. Um, and you just go, I have no idea how to start. Just start listing things off from the corner. Just go, okay. This question, asking about this. Okay, I know this, 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 this. Doing something frees up the rest of your mind. When I was, the first time I got shot at, uh, it was on this road called Route Barley. It was this road uh, raised about 20 meters and about 200, 200, raised about 20 feet or whatever, not 20 meters, it's a lot. Uh, and uh, about two, two, 200 meters either side is a tree line. Mm -hmm. Classic ambush area. We got ambushed there all the time. But the first time I got shot at, you know, bullets, you know, hitting all around me and didn't hit me. But the first time I tried to be a, I tried, I tried to be the smallest person alive in that, in in the hatch of that vehicle. Just tried to be the smallest possible. And I didn't do anything for the first like couple minutes. But then I remember my drill sergeant saying, "Just do something." He's. <laughs> His phrase was just pull the trigger. You can you can use it as a metaphor, or in my case, literal. Just do it. I shot a tree three times. After that, it was really easy to actually fire back because once you do something, it frees up your mind. Hmm. You don't have to have a gun to do it, but like I said, during a test, just start writing something, anything that you know. Oftentimes, the answer will just come to you. Just do something. something. Just pull the trigger. Um, how did your wartime experiences affect your life? There is not a day that goes by where I haven't thought about it. There's, I think I can count on one hand the number of nights that I haven't had a nightmare. It's not. It. Like I said, that that folder you file everything away in, away in from combat opens up after a while. You can't keep it away forever. And when it opens up, it's not good. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to deal with. It's hard to explain. It's hard to codify. It's hard, it's hard to just tell somebody who has no idea what it is like yeah who wasn't there and like I said I don't talk to any guy, any guys in the army anymore but I have a lot of veteran friends at 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 UC Davis but most of them aren't combat I'm one of two who's in combat mm -hmm. it's just it's just hard to explain yeah so it's just like easier to explain that to someone that could share resemblance to yeah. what yeah you're feeling yeah it's combat is like 
fear and hate and anger and and the weirdest thing is happiness all distilled down to one action combat's combat's addicting it's something you will always remember there's some music that I listen to that automatically reminds me of a certain firefight I was in there's There's places, there's things, like rebar. They used to mark IEDs with rebar. Mm -hmm. And whenever I see rebar, I kind of just freeze up a little bit. Yeah. Because that's an IED. Well, it's not here, but yeah. it, it's hard to deal with. Yeah. A, fo a four-door white sedan. On Christmas Day, we got blown up by a uh, car bomb. Didn't hurt anybody, didn't even scratch the paint of the vehicle. But it was a four-door sedan. Later on, I'm realizing that I don't like four-door sedans, or white four-door sedans. I don't like being in large groups or in loud areas. I don't like fireworks. I just, you know, put noise-canceling headphones on and just deal with it, but... Yeah. They, I, I avoid large crowds. I sit on the edge in, like, lecture halls. I don't like people around me very much. I don't like being touched. It's really kind of maybe antisocial sometimes. But, you know, I live alone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, do you remember any songs based or about the Iraqi, soar, so, Iraqi war? Any songs about the Iraq war? Based. Yeah. No. No. I remember songs that like one time, uh, my uh, my uh, squad leader uh, liked to play country over the uh, uh, in, uh, uh, inner vehicle inner vehicle um, like communications. We all we, we all wore headsets in, 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 inside the vehicle, with the radios and whatnot, mm -hmm. and we spliced in an iPod to the um, to the actual intercom system. And you have to play country. And I hate the country. And um, we, um, so one day I decided to, to mess with them. I selected a song and locked the iPhone, like completely, like, like, you know, tried to open it like a dozen times wrongly and it locked it for like 50 minutes or something like that. And um, the song was Aqua's Barbie Girl. <laughs> and it starts playing and um, right the right the moment I hit play, we got into one of the worst ambushes I've ever I've, I've ever been in. It was three hours solid of this song playing over getting shot at and shooting back. And I can't hear that song without thinking about that. It is the dumbest song I've ever I've ever heard, and that's why I chose it. But that song was playing for three hours in my head. It was like during the whole entire ambush. Oh, it was horrible. It made the ambush so much worse. <laughs> um, how, is, how has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? For the first bunch of years, I hated the military. I hated war. Who doesn't? But recently, I've been kind of re-embracing what it means to be a veteran, what it... What it means to have been in combat, means to have served, and kind of realizing that the, the military wasn't all bad. It wasn't just, you know, a horrifying experience for me. It taught me a lot about life, about what I, about what I should do, how to succeed in general. A lot of those, uh, a lot of those messages were kind of buried under a lot of screaming and swear words and, you know, Plus all the dirt and whatnot, but it took me a while to, re to, to, to really, really realize what I actually learned. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Um, what messages would you like to leave for future generations who will view or hear this interview? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Join the military for the right reasons, not because you have like an ideal about the military, 
Join it because you believe in this country and you think that service should be something that you need. Don't do it for your own advancement because honestly it's, it isn't there for that. A lot of people do use it for that, but it shouldn't be there for that. Use it to learn more about yourself, to serve somebody else for a change or something else bigger than yourself. Don't do it for yourself. Do it for the, do it for the country. Do, do, for, do, do it for the ideals. I know this country oftentimes thinks uh, we're the worst things on the planet, but really we're doing pretty all right. Mm -hmm. So there's worse things to fight for. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this in interview? If so, what would that be? I don't think so. All right, thank you so much for your time and for your service. Appreciate it.